Was the U.S. a colonial power? Yes, but only half-heartedly. The U.S. had one major colony. The Philippines had a great deal of influence over various nations in the Caribbean. Compared to what the possibilities were, this is relatively minor. Surprisingly, the U.S. actually turned down many different near misses for being a much larger colonial empire. All of the regions on this map were almost nearly incorporated into the United States. How would the world, America, borders, culture, wars, and demographics be different if the U.S. had gone full colonial empire? What if, as a thought experiment, the U.S. did annex every region that got close to doing so? That is the question of this alternate history. The U.S. may not have reached its full potential as a colonial empire, but that doesn't mean you have to. If you want to grow up to lead your country to become a massive colonial empire and oppress all your neighbors, you'll need to improve your skills now. Brilliant is a great place to start. They have courses in stuff like logic, scientific thinking, mathematical fundamentals, and introduction to neural networks. I took and liked their logic course, which is so important for doing alternate history properly and conquering your neighbors. Brilliant helps you learn difficult mental processes in a way that's fun. It helps you develop critical thinking skills and improve attention to detail. All of their courses are developed by experts and professionals from places like MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, or Google, so it's all properly done. Click the link in the description to get started today. The first 200 people to click the link get 20% off their annual subscription. Start learning today with Brilliant. There are two reasons the U.S. didn't feel comfortable going full empire. The first was that the U.S. was a former colony itself, and saw the clear hypocrisy in the situation involved. This was briefly dealt with during the imperial high water mark around 1900 by effectively using the white man's burden argument and racism, and that it was okay to colonize non-white primitive peoples. However, this belief was only half-hearted, and significant parts of America's population absolutely detested any American colonialism. The U.S. had a sort of bizarre guilt-driven relationship with a lot of the colonies it did end up having for this very reason. The U.S. put way more investment into its colonial domains than did any other colonial powers, since the U.S. felt so guilty about having colonies in the first place. This didn't offset how the American colonial efforts often entailed brutal and bloody wars, such as the crushing of the Moro Rebellion in the Philippines. In this timeline, the U.S. is just a much more imperialist nation. Perhaps one of the Founding Fathers is deeply, blatantly imperialist, thus creating a tradition of tolerance for aggressive jingoism and imperialism in America. The second was the divide between the North and South. Much of these opportunities for a colonial empire fall before the Civil War, in which the U.S. acted very much like a divided country. Both sides were actively trying to weaken the other. Most of these expansions would have resulted in a greater Southern slave bloc, which would have weakened the North, and thus the North bloc dead. A good example of this is the Trail of Tears, which was the act that evicted the native tribes from much of the southeastern United States. It only barely passed. Northerners tried to block it, not out of love for the Native Americans, more that they preferred to have natives there than Southerners. In this timeline, the Southerners are capable of bribing the North to let the U.S. annex all these areas to America's South by first offering them the possibility of conquering Canada and then shifting over to a transcontinental railroad based out of the North that would open up lots of free states. Since the South broke every single promise it had before the Civil War, they would likely break this one as well, which would add another grudge the North would hold against the South when the war would come. This timeline has lots of points of departure and is basically a weird grab bag video. The first point of departure is that the U.S. annexes far more of Mexico in the Mexican-American War. War hawks and President Polk's office wanted to annex the next top third of Mexico. Similarly, the white planter elite in the Yucatan also begged the U.S. for entrance to the Union, a topic which I've made a video about before. As mentioned before, the North-South politics were basically what resulted in the U.S. not taking this greater amount of land in Mexico. Mexico was not a functioning state, with American troops occupying Mexico City, and so the U.S. could have taken what it wanted to. Before the Civil War, we need to add another region to the United States. In 1854, William Walker, an enterprising Southerner, launched a coup attempt in Nicaragua to annex it to America and actually succeeded. 
However, he was defeated by Mr. Vanderbilt, an American millionaire who owned the transport company there and so funded the resistance to kick Walker out. Walker tried to launch a few more coups, but was eventually shot in 1860 by local resistance. In this timeline, Walker is a little bit less insane, and so Vanderbilt comes to the conclusion he can do business with him. Vanderbilt works with Walker and supports him. The U.S. already having the Yucatan decides to annex Nicaragua when it comes under the control of the Anglo-Americans. Since this is already a wank video, I'm going to throw in an absolutely bizarre variable for fun. The U.S. decides to pay more attention to Liberia. In our timeline, Liberia was the much-forgotten U.S. pseudo-colony in which, in a phase in which the U.S. was unsure what to do with its black population, considered sending them back to Africa. Only 12,000 took this opportunity, and then the U.S. forgot about Liberia, leaving it to its own bizarre devices. In this timeline, the U.S. takes a more active role. Rather than being an abandoned child, Liberia is an American puppet. The Civil War would still happen. The South would have more Senate seats from their larger geographic region, but they had already dominated the Senate in our timeline. The main variable that finally triggered the Civil War was that the North's white population was growing at a significantly faster rate than the South's, and thus the North was entering a position in which it could abolish slavery without the South's consent. The area and timescale would not be great enough to really affect the long-term demographic variables involved. The effect of the Civil War would be the same. The North had an immense naval advantage over the South and thus could seize the areas like Nicaragua and the Yucatan within the first few months of the war. Northern Mexico would not enough people to matter yet. Besides that, the North's massive demographic and industrial advantage would mean it would still win. The North of Mexico was very lightly settled during the Mexican-American War. The North of Mexico was in fact colonized at roughly the same time by the Mexicans as the American West was by the Americans. The Mexican northern territories like California, Texas, and New Mexico were like tiny islands of western civilization that took months to reach from the populous areas of central Mexico by caravan. Much of what the U.S. would annex in this timeline in what is currently northern Mexico was barely settled at this point. The United States was going through an incredible demographic expansion in this period, while Mexico was stagnant, which would mean that the U.S. could easily settle this region with white Americans before Mexico's big era of population rise starting in the late 19th century. Northern Mexico would look a lot like the American Southwest. The Yucatan is a harder situation to deal with. The region had a large native Maya population. The U.S. wasn't very nice to the native peoples, and so they would likely be shoved onto reservations or flee to Maya-majority neighboring Guatemala. The region would be climactically perfect for southern-style plantations, and so the population would be heavily black, but having only 12 years before the Civil War would prevent an overwhelming black plantation economy from developing. The Yucatan would be an honorary, more Hispanic version of the Deep South. Nicaragua is roughly similar to the Yucatan, but it would be annexed right before the Civil War and thus would have very little slave influence. The black population would be small, and there would be much less of a plantation economy involved. However, that would likely just make the region poorer as it wouldn't have a main export. Liberia is really interesting. If the U.S. took a real interest in the region, it would encourage more American black immigration to it. Perhaps the government would make voyages of American blacks to Liberia cheaper in order to incentivize them to leave America. Liberia is one of the most bizarre countries ever. The black Americans who immigrated there went about recreating the society they came from, except with them as the slave owners. They instituted a slave trade where they built mansions in the style of the American South and recreated the same manners and way of life. The native population even called the American blacks the whites. Liberia became over time a desperately poor nation, one of the poorest in the world, in fact. If we're assuming Liberia would get a large wave of several 10,000 black Americans after the Civil War, that would mean Liberia could be a relatively large player in Africa at the time who had very few foreign powers involved yet. It would get around the main issue that Western powers had colonizing Africa, in which the Europeans had no immunity to African diseases by using westernized Africans to do the colonizing for them. 
you could see Liberia spreading into the neighboring regions in Africa. This would probably trigger the scramble for Africa a decade or more earlier as the European powers would rush to grab land, as the Americans would start to spread more influence across the continent. If the US took a more active interest in Liberia, Liberia would be a bit more of a democracy with some more property rights and wealthier. It probably wouldn't be all sunshine and rainbows, the Western powers did some bad stuff in Africa. The main addition towards the turn of the 20th century would be Cuba and the Spanish-American War. The US considered annexing Cuba in our timeline but decided against it since it didn't want a state of mixed-race Catholics. Unlike Nicaragua, the Yucatan, and northern Mexico, Cuba had a fair pre-existing population. Americans would have trouble becoming the majority here. Like our timeline, Americans would come to dominate Cuban industry, with it becoming an effective American economic satellite. The U.S. could theoretically annex Haiti and the Dominican Republic, both of which the U.S. militarily occupied, in Haiti's case for 20 years around World War I. The U.S. would really gain very little from this, and the only reason would be imperial pride, which is just a matter of degree. Surprisingly, the U.S. would likely never get involved with Panama in the first place. The reason the U.S. got involved in Panama was for the canal, but there are two different regions in that area that are suitable for a canal. Panama is one, Nicaragua is the other. The original Pacific Atlantic Canal was attempted in Nicaragua, where the total distance is shorter, but there's more variation in altitude. In this timeline, the U.S. builds the canal in Nicaragua, while Panama remains part of Colombia. This would make Nicaragua significantly wealthier, effectively giving it Panama's position as lock keeper, while Panama would be completely poor and obscure. The U.S. would still colonize the Philippines just as it did in our timeline. With the U.S. owning territory on both sides of Mexico, the U.S. would effectively have to keep Mexico a puppet state at all costs in order to not disturb the American-owned regions. This would likely initially start with propping up the aristocratic classes, which would be the easiest way to maintain stability. But with the start of the Mexican Civil War around World War I, which would still happen due to Malthusian reasons, the inherently anti-aristocratic U.S. would start to support more liberal, if not democratic, regimes. Mexico would be kept on a very tight leash by the United States. This would have both negative and positive effects. On one hand, many Mexican industries, like their oil sector was before 1938, would be in American hands. On the other, America would do more to curb the anti-democratic and anti-capitalist tendencies of the pre-government that ruled for much of our 20th century. This would make Mexico a wealthier country, albeit not a freer one. Strangely enough, this would likely result in less Mexican immigration to the U.S. as the Mexican economy would be able to keep up with their great 20th century population growth, which would mean there wouldn't be immense pressures to immigrate to the United States. The question of statehood is quite difficult. Once a region would reach a certain percentage white American population, it would be bound to become a state. Thus, the north of Mexico and the Yucatan would be states, while Nicaragua is an open question. For much of this era, the U.S. viewed itself as a white Protestant nation, and thus the native Hispanic populations would not be treated well, and any area that was majority Hispanic would have little chance of statehood until World War II at least. These territories would give the U.S. a significant Hispanic population, thus American identity would in many ways be formed as more of an opposition to the Hispanic elements. Groups like the Irish, Jews, and Italians would actually be treated better for not being Hispanics. This is really dumb, but in America, race is often viewed in literal black and white terms. However, adding in a large Hispanic population would add an interesting third variable. This would be compounded by massive racial diversity inside the Hispanic community, with Hispanic views on racial identification as more fluid than American, with in Hispanic countries, someone who is two-thirds European ancestry will identify as white. Many Hispanics would want to be treated as whites in the American racial system, only to get rejected. After World War II, there'd be massive soul-searching in the part of the American nation on what role the larger Hispanic population in the colonial empire would play. Colonialism and racism became much less acceptable after World War II, and the massive cultural revolution of the 1960s completely shifted culture's priorities. 
the U.S. would likely still give up the Philippines, which had little economic reason to be in, and was distantly removed from the rest of the U.S.'s territories. Similarly, the U.S. would likely abandon Liberia in the same way that all the Western powers abandoned their African territories. After around 1890, colonialism stopped being about actual policy and started being more of a fashion statement to demonstrate how developed and powerful your nation was. African colonies were more vanity projects that almost always costed more than they were worth. When colonialism stopped being fashionable after World War II, the European powers dropped their African colonies without a fight. Liberia's only worthwhile exports would be rubber and possibly cocoa, products America wouldn't be willing to keep its influence for, thus America would abandon Liberia. This would result in the African-American elite entrenching themselves into their position of authority, similarly to what happened in our timeline or apartheid South Africa. As their power would become more unstable, they would become crueler. Like our timeline, there'd be a rebellion of the native African peoples who would seize power after a couple decades. For all those interested, look up Liberia's civil war. It's fascinating stuff. They had a cannibal president whose main general was called General Butt Naked. For the territories closer to the U.S. itself, things would get messy. The U.S. would be unwilling to give up territories so close to America during the Cold War when they could possibly become bastions of communist influence. A major conflict inside American culture would come from whether Spanish should become an official language. Even after decades of mandatory English instruction in schools, these regions would still likely have a large Spanish-speaking population. American identity in many ways is formed around English-speaking, and adding Spanish as an official language would become a major identity crisis for America. This question would likely not be fully answered as of 2020, but America would see greater acceptance of Hispanic culture and the acceptance of Cuba as a state. We would start to see a greater mix of Anglo and Hispanic culture. There would be many Cuban, Yucatanese, and Nicaraguan immigrants in the lower 48 in the same way there are many Puerto Rican immigrants. These regions would be significantly wealthier. There is just no way of getting around it. America's legendary respect for property rights and stability means that they'd be much wealthier. You can look at comparisons of standard of living between the U.S. and Mexican sides of the border, which have the same climate, ethnicity, geography, and every other variable, but the American side is so much wealthier. Similarly, Puerto Rico is the wealthiest part of the Caribbean, with the main exception being the Bahamas, which are effectively an economic outpost of the United States. There wouldn't be a lot of clamoring for independence. These areas would know that without the U.S., they'd be significantly poorer and all would have significant populations of white Americans who would fight to the death to keep their territories states. You see this in Puerto Rico, where only a small percentage of the population want independence. This timeline doesn't affect geopolitics much. This part of the world is already America's backyard in our timeline, and so not much exciting happens here without the U.S. going insane. One shift would be that the states of Central America, between the Yucatan and Nicaragua, would be American puppets and American economic dependencies, as much of their economies would be based upon being the transit route between the Yucatan and Nicaragua. A similar thing could be said of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. What if altist, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check me out on Patreon where I've got all sorts of cool maps and the history of the world. Or alternatively, check out my Twitter. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.